All right, I'll take chat's word for it. We'll watch the new next po vid. I do like the channel. Wayne Kernighan was stuck at home during an excruciatingly long winter. He was what his parents believed to was be his a name problem Wien? child, experiencing nightmares, arguing with his seven siblings, and getting in trouble at school. Having gone on record to state that his father beats him with hockey sticks, it was undeniable that their humble abode in Damn. suburban Connecticut was less of a place of refuge for him. The man on the phone says that Wayne should come right away and that they'll have a private jet waiting for him at Danbury Airport. What a good deal. His mom tells him not to worry. Wow. And that it's more of an outdoor camp type thing that'll make him better. So Wayne packed up his stuff that night. Eager, sure. Nervous, yes. But absolutely awaiting the things to come. Choir on why he was sent there. Who made this vid? It's next, Poe. Drugs. I keep seeing this one's fucked up. Wayne began to question whether he Why? was going to the place he thought he was. The cults are known to be Something pretty cool. Didn't seem right. Looks like a camp, he thinks. However, when he exits the vehicle, he isn't greeted with the silent serenity of nature. But instead, the screaming. Yeah, but that could mean anything. I scream when I'm having a lot of fun. Like, yeehaw, we're having fun. Yeah, I saw the American Horror Story cult season. American Horror Story is the best shitty show. Across the United States, a rise in for-profit behavior modification facilities were in action. Now called the troubled teen or tough love industry, it seemed to be a money machine aimed at altering and stifling troublesome behavior in adolescents. Well, the someone's got to. Is hard to gauge. Given that this was the decade following the rise of the hippie subculture, authority was and had been challenged Whoa! for years. That facial hair is kind of nutty. That looks cool. It's like Wolverine, but not cool like Wolverines. It's like a little cushion. That's nice. That's like an OG neck beard. In early 1970, a psychiatrist Thanks named Gerald Davidson, Finca. alongside investor David Goldberg and a man named Joseph Ritchie, would band together to create a school named Elan, a private co-ed behavior modification program geared from grade 8 to beyond high school. <clears throat> Ritchie built the facility as one that would correct bad behavior by teens without punishment, while painting himself as a genuine mentor that could help make that happen. They had a website? I've gone on record to state that their initial outside impression of the school was that it was like a summer camp in the main woods. However, it looks like a level. summer camp. Furthermore, some have stated it does look like Crystal Lake the vehicle expecting a lively campground. They're instead faced with a sight much stranger. Some students were spotted wearing degrading signs, some shackled in handcuffs, what? some being yelled at. Point. It's they take discipline very seriously. To flee. School was marketed, touting itself as an altruistic institution, genuinely concerned with helping troubled teenagers get better. It was clear from the outside that those claims were a reach. Is that Charles Manson teaching the class? But Man, they got celebrities, they teachers. Good for them. Observe the so this is pretty recent. To, to each parent. Dear parents, or very aware of how lonely and confused you must feel as you sit down to read this. If you're like the parents of most of our students, you're faced with an adolescent whose behavior is out of control and you don't know why. A youngster who's been given everything and is throwing it all away is difficult to understand, but you can see that this process is progressive. The most saddening part is knowing that your offspring is ruining his or her future. Mm. Your own pain is difficult, but your pain for your child is unbearable. Yeah, they're not reaching their but full potential. Line, it's been noted that Joseph Ritchie was somewhat of a salesman. He was charismatic and excelled at convincing parents of all the good that Elan could do for their kids. The good that, as we'll soon find, was all a lie. Reportedly, once your parents agree to send you off to Elan and pay the $50,000 tuition fee, they designate a time and date with Alon's so-called teen escort service. They wow. won't pick you up during the day, though. Instead, in the middle of the night when you're fast Why, asleep, though? they would bust through your door and <laughs> kidnap you. Why? In years past, Alon's staff have stated that since the child has no say in attending, 
their capture hinges on the element of surprise. Okay. According to a blog, two so are these just the stories? Bedroom, what? Physically subduing them. Are these just stories this guy makes up? What? No. What? Is all you read creepy pastas? Why? Why would he make up a fifty-two minute story and make websites to corroborate it and and evidence and stuff? It's just like a history lesson that's well presented. Tying them up with plastic handcuffs, throwing them into a van, and then driving them to Poland, Maine, where they'd be handed over to the Elon School. Such experiences often traumatized the teens who were abducted. For all they knew at first, they were being taken by criminals to be held ransom, tortured, or worse, killed. This practice became notorious around the United States, eventually earning its nickname, the Elon Snatch. If this so this was so well known that it, it had its own name? Morality wasn't the school's strong suit. The 70s man? What are you talking about? This was in 2000. They have a fucking website. Had a website. Day one. Students would typically arrive to Elon during the early morning hours of the day. Oh, Due it started in the, the 70s. Oh, campus, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I see what you're saying. To resist their escorts. I see what you're saying. It's Sorry. It's noted that their capture was designed this way utilizing their escape attempt against them as a tool to convey that no matter what, they're not getting out of there. Often, the first stop would be the dormitory showers, which served as a tool in robbing each student of their sense of individuality. Reportedly, students are thrown into them with absolutely no privacy and are demanded to remove all of their clothing and valuable items. After complying, they're given what Elon calls no-image clothing which, as the name implies, simply includes a bland, colorless shirt and pants, effectively forcing them into a state of conformity. Well, let's not get carried away. The, a white, white t-shirt's pretty each cool. New student would be taken into a common area where there is I, I wouldn't with necessarily look too deep brother. into that. This, in essence, was a tenured student designated to be a guide. On paper, they were told to help their students adjust to their new life on campus, somewhat like a peer while educating them on how great and effective the program is. As we've seen in studies like the Stanford Prison Experiment, I'm sure you can see why this wouldn't be a bad idea. I don't know that experiment. Oftentimes, Big Brother figures, much like staff, would take great pleasure in exerting their superiority over the newer students. It looks like the house from Promised Neverland. If you want to act like a baby, you get screamed at. If you want to act as more like a mature adolescent, you get talked to. Oh, so I was like, wait, Speaking what? Speaking of cults. Was that footage from uh, Elon University? Is it, is it Elon or Elan? I don't know how to say it. Either way. But didn't he just say that they were forced to wear, like, the colorless shirts? Because that guy, like, that second guy, he's kind of dripped out. He's got a chain on. He's got a red button up. Oh, that was staff. Gotcha. The social hierarchy at Elon is structured in a way that heavily resembles one. At the school... Students like Professor are Snape. placed into two categories. Strengths, which were tenured, obedient students that were a few steps up the totem pole, and non-strengths, the newer ones who typically resisted treatments. Strengths were allowed to talk to fellow strengths and non-strengths. Non-strengths, on the other hand, were only permitted to communicate with strengths. If a non-strength were caught communicating with a non-strength, harsh punishment would soon greet them. They were quickly disconnected, reprimanded and robbed of any future potential. So if this is supposed to be a scam again. I feel like this is a lot more effort than just not top of the phone manipulation. Doing this. Every Elon resident was It seems like so much more work to abuse the kids. Letter, which as you might expect is an explanation of how great the Elon school is for them. All the great activities they do there and how well they're progressing through the program. These letters would be heavily scrutinized before being mailed out to their parents. Yeah, cases, I get that it's a cult, verbally but usually cults have a the purpose. The Elon school staff. It was clear to students that they weren't getting away from this anytime soon. And after realizing this, their minds would often pivot away from rebellion and towards compliance in hopes of power. Yeah, money. I, uh, that's why I would think they'd want to run a scam to as opposed to a cult. And it'd be so much easier to ultimately stuck not abuse the kids. It takes a lot more work to do that, I imagine. To make their escape. So I'm assuming there is a point to the cult, like they want to turn these kids into like super soldiers or something, I don't really know. But if it was just a scam, they're putting a lot of work into it. Whereas they could just take the kids here for 50k a year and As just let them expect, play basketball the and sleep. The school were immense. 
exerting nearly totalitarian control over everything that happens. Joe Ritchie's set of rules, which he called guilt, was gargantuan and needlessly meticulous. I did tier one Wilu. As a student at Elan, you would be expected to refrain from doing the following. Having any image, reading as a non-strength, not completing learning experiences, writing without permission, oh. being sideways, oh, looking at means. security zones, non-strength interacting, talking too loudly, talking too softly, looking at the opposite gender, Whoa. being attracted to someone, Whoa. any physical contact, looking out windows, unauthorized <laughs> drawing, not listening to higher Holy ranks, shit. pretending to sleep at night, thinking of running away, being in the bathroom for too long, wearing dark clothing, being manipulative, being lazy while working, listening to music, talking too much, showering for- All in all, they're minutes, pretty lenient. Not talking enough, making facial reactions to orders, negative body language, pretending not to have guilt, oversleeping, undersleeping, smiling, and the list goes on and on. That's not bad. Clearly these rules were not designed to be followed. Basically a lawless place over there. to become commonplace. To help enforce these, individuals known and as expediters were designated by the school to stand on watch with clipboards. Primarily, they were known to catch those that broke three rules. Being attracted to members Makes of the opposite gender, Uzi. looking at the opposite gender, and making prolonged eye contact with anyone else. Since expediters too were required to fill their clipboards with names and infractions at the risk of their own punishment, they frequently and unapologetically made assumptions and accusations that were a lie. It says, and the requirement to wear a bright yellow t-shirt and short pink shorts. The school figured that without laces, their shoes were effectively useless. What? In turn preventing any ability to move any faster than a walk. What is it a like barbed wire on the ground or something? Risk punishment Just go barefoot. Was shown with this student. Instead of a t-shirt and shorts though, he was forced to wear a bright pink rabbit suit with cuffs around his legs. It's unclear if this is a repeat offender, but it raises the question as to how far Alon would actually go with this tactic. Thanks, the recent hunter. Students that smiled at a place were punished by wearing dunce caps and reduced to work that the school calls shot down. These involved repetitious, dull tasks like mopping floors, scrubbing the insides of trash cans, and even cleaning toilets with just a single toothbrush. For Man, if I went to one of these in, fucking schools, if my parents sent me here, I would never forgive them. Down. It's been noted that approval by sometimes six or more superiors was required before you were able. And even then, an escort had to watch you while you were in there. This, on top of a myriad of other degrading punishments, like some retribution. sign and diaper wearing, it's clear that Alon kept an iron grip on their daily operations. Their daily operations that took up most of the daily schedule, and those that were deceptively named by the Alon school themselves as their treatment. Makes it a bit savage. And give some Ethan. But I will say, all of these punishments are relatively tame compared to what we're about to talk about. Let's just say, if you pissed off a staff member, they could start something called a general meeting on you. And trust me, you wouldn't want one. That doesn't sound so intense. What, we're just gonna debate, huh? There seemed to be no standard for them. Get your feelings off, the administrator screams. And following this, each student in the room would begin screaming at and berating the student, firing off slurs and obscenities. For oh, so it's like room. Twitter. No matter how much Pretty the innovative. Pled for everyone to stop, no matter how much they broke down, no matter how much they cried, general meetings would not end until the admin said so. And when it finally did, the victim would lie there, often crying and exhausted at the relentless abuse that they'd just endured. <clears throat> it's clear that general meetings aren't designed <clears throat> to reprimand. They're designed to completely break each and every student that's the subject of one. And with this, we can effectively put the points together that Alon was doing nothing more than running an operation that commanded total compliance. Any self-thought or Teddy. sliver of independence that students thought they had True, was gone. They were merely reduced to weapons. Weapons that, at a moment's notice, could just as easily be used against them.
7 p.m. Are they also haunted by vampires or something too? Like how much worse can it get? Contrary Fucking werewolves or something? on academia and outside marketing, school time within Elan was secondhand to the student's treatment. Typically, the time frame for learning was 7 to 11 p.m., but sometimes could run longer. As you might expect, there were no extracurriculars, no physical Basically education, two on squish no in the projects, resub, Kakaru, zero, no legitimate and exams, Gingar. nothing. Instead, students were required to grade themselves the on work that they were self-assigned with absolutely no direction. Allegedly, he believed students were easier to control while sleep deprived and utilized even this as a medium to work against them. By 11 p.m., if a student makes it through a night of work without issue, school hours then draw to a close. Not bad. They're quickly released from class and escorted to their dorms, which were often in the form of uncomfortable, impersonal, military style bunk beds. That's military style, a piece of wood. Sleep was known to be difficult, as designated students named Night Owls were assigned to stand guard with flashlights. In regular intervals, they'd shine them on the sleeping students to both ensure that they hadn't escaped and to secure the fact that they're actually asleep. <laughs> what? A requirement that, as we can recall, was also in the list of Alon's rules. And if one actually manages to calm their nerves, dozing off into their only time of tranquility, that would allow them to effectively place the cap on a day in the nightmare. That I just want to see if like the main guy behind it's still alive, but I don't want it to be a, sp a spoiler either. His name was like Joe something and I forgot, so I'm trying to find it. It says, I don't think it's Joe Rogan, but it keeps wanting me to type in Joe Rogan. It was like Joe something. Richie, that's what it was. He's dead. Damn. A notorious aspect of Elan, among everything else that happened there, was something called the Ring. Considered the highest level of punishment, Elan staff could make the call to start the Ring at any time. Enough for a specific student. Oh, I gave them safety equipment. In the Ring, a student's designated as a bully and is outfitted with a face guard and gloves. No one was safe from the Ring either. Some bore pre existing injuries. Some were much smaller than their opponent, and some were even pregnant. Wait, what? Even worse, things seem to be treated like a game with superiors commentating. This is only up to like high school. On TV. In reality, how are the? This was the further. Wait, I'm super curious then. So, how were some of them pregnant? Because you're not even allowed to look at the opposite gender, and assuming that you lived here for a year, how would you get pregnant? That makes no sense to me. I guess if they could have arrived pregnant. Which would check out. Staff? Oh, by the, I see what you're saying, by the staff. Right, 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 right. Thanks to the prime material. I keep forgetting that there's actual adults behind this. Because it looks like, it, it sounds like they literally only appoint the students to do everything here. It's like Lord of the Flies. This thing from TV. It costs $17,400 to send the average youngster to Elon for one year. Even at that price, there are judges, hey, social workers, and parents who consider it a bargain. Elan's defenders claim it has the most consistently effective program for salvaging young people who are too difficult for other facilities to handle. It's administered by the kids, first of all. Corporal, it's a, it's a harsh term, okay? What it is, is we have the ring, okay, which... Uh, <sighs> Oh, he's Everybody super open about it. It's, it's not a boxing ring. It's a ring of human people. The bully is introduced as what he is. In this corner is the bully who's trying to turn this facility into a detention center. Okay? And in this corner is the house champion who's going to show him why it can't be done. And that's exactly how it does. And we never allow the bully to win. Uh, but girls get put in the ring, too. Well, girls bully as well as boys do. I mean, you know, it doesn't... It's... Uh, you know, we're, we're a uh, equal rights facility. Uh, oh, that's progressive, okay. Spanking, which is symbolic. Again, it's a last resort. Okay, wow. and, it's, and it's one resident spanking another resident, and it's done with a ping pong paddle, okay? And uh, usually a person won't get spanked more than once or twice. But it's a symbolic thing, which is if you're gonna act like a baby, you should be treated like a baby. On December so he is just super open about it. 
a 15-year-old Elan student named Philip Williams was placed into the ring. And so, that evening, a ring session commenced with Phil as the bully. There was fight, after fight, after fight. In the end, it's been reported that he was beaten up so badly that he fell flat on the floor, and it took an entire 20 minutes before an ambulance was called to help him. 20 minutes or so they called the ambulance. They took Phil and they never saw him again, his sister claims. I thought it was a wonderful place. I thought they were helping my brother. I thought he was coming home. How, like, how can you think that when they actually yeah, kidnapped right. him? In a box. Like, I don't get that delusion. Alon's Their technique was to kidnap was them. That he had regularly faked headaches. The cause of death? A brain aneurysm. And no charges were ever filed against them. Yeah. That cult is one by the name of Synanon. Never heard of it. And I know a lot of cults. Howdy. With a warrant to investigate reports of child abuse. In recent years, Synanon began calling itself a religion. He's 52 years old. He's deaf in one ear. Uh, he's an egomaniac. But one of the wisest persons that I've ever met in my life. He knows how to get people moving. He creates turbulence. Gentlemen. Is the prime bone notice, scope? No member of the California Department of Corrections is permitted on Synanon property unless he has the express permission of Charles D. Very cool Chairman spectacles. What is he, a fighter pilot? In early 1958, a man by the name of Charles Dedrick Sr. would found the group in Santa Monica, California. It was intended to be a drug rehabilitation program aimed at delinquents. However, in the years that followed, it appeared to stray from that mission entirely. The distinguishing form of therapy employed by Synanon was something called the game, which in today's terms is more commonly known as attack therapy. The focus of the game was That's to a really break down weird the social construct of an individual's mind by attack first allowing therapy. them to open up about themselves before commencing an aggressive beratement session, much like we discussed earlier with general meetings. The primary goal was to recreate someone's personality and sense of self by completely demolishing Thanks everything they know about themselves the before mango. rebuilding them as a newer, subjectively better person. It hinged on the brink of legality while being entirely immoral. And, unsurprisingly, by 1991, the cult would disband due to criminal convictions that caught up to many of their members. The founder also died just six years later, leaving behind a dark legacy that, to this day, is known as one of the most dangerous and violent cults that America has ever seen. That's weird. I've never heard of them. This is, of course, the abridged history. To be honest with you, I could make an entire hour-long video on the operations and practices of Synanon. Oh, they look like they're having fun. For another day. If there's one takeaway tonight, though, it's that an unknowing source inspiration and blueprint for other institutions to follow. One of those being Alon, and by utilizing similar practices, they appeared to carry the torch that Synanon was forced to abandon. They knew they had to keep up appearances too, thriving off an immaculate public Thank image Brian, spearheaded by the charisma of Joe Ritchie. Joe. Before the age of the internet, admittedly this Man's was Man's built with prime pink. Why didn't they fight back? Brother kids. What do you mean? Through the late 70s and into the early 80s, reports of the true nature of Elan began to spread by word of mouth from former students. Authorities in Maine reportedly visited the school upwards of 12 times to investigate, however returned with absolutely nothing to show for it. Frustratingly, the operation that Joe Ritchie was running was completely and entirely legal. There were no laws in place for facilities like this, so it was allowed to remain in operation without issue. As we touched on, the media was the primary in for outsiders the at the lawn. However, even they failed to communicate Chaco. the extent of their operations. While they <clears> should <throat> select parts of it, unfortunately Joe Ritchie was given enough airtime to convince the public and the news crew that it was nothing more than their treatment taking place. By dehumanizing the students, Emphasizing their delinquencies on national television, he was able to use this notoriety to his advantage, 
ultimately swaying the public opinion into believing that what he was doing was entirely good. On top of the growing number of alumni though, came an increase in escapees, which only furthered Alon's unwanted infamy. Over the years, three students, a 16-year-old unidentified individual, nice. a 15-year-old Brad Glickman, Good work. and a 17-year-old Don Birnbaum would all escape successfully, however would meet wildly differing fates. Oh. For the 16-year-old, it's been reported that he ran over 15 miles through the wilderness in the middle of the night. He was eventually caught by an officer, Max Ashburn, and after hearing the boy's story and observing his physical condition, he helped him return home. What a good guy! For Brad Glickman, he was shot. Oh. In 1990, after escaping Elon's search parties, what? he made his way to a house in a small town. Authorities believe that he had a connection to the girl that lived there. However, the homeowner opened fire, ultimately killing him. What? Uh... What? That's like the most American shit I've ever heard in my life. Uh, this guy must know my daughter. Like, what? Jesus Christ. Actually, two give subs kill command in the resub Terra in tier one summer. And for Don Birnbaum, How she unlucky. too had escaped the clutches of Elon, eventually finding a trucker named James Cruz who was willing to take her home. A few hours down the road though, Birnbaum would find that Cruz's true intentions weren't quite so virtuous. Oh Jesus. As it turned out, he sexually assaulted her on the side of the highway before strangling and abandoning her body between routes 26 Holy and 550 fuck. in Pennsylvania. She was discovered by another motorist with a yellow rope tied around her neck and without clothes from the waist down. And from her corpse were tire tracks resembling that of a semi-trailer. Since Birnbaum had crossed state wow. lines, an FBI investigation was commenced for her. And after cross-checking with numerous similar cases that have happened in the area, the truck belonging to James Cruz was deemed as the culprit. Upon catching up to him and searching his vehicle, authorities were able to find but a single blonde hair that belonged to Birnbaum, effectively leading to his arrest. That's incredible detective work. Much like, just think about that for a second. This is in the middle of fucking nowhere. Random trucker picks up a random student. Well, student's the wrong word. Random person from a, a cult, and they somehow tracked it down to the right guy who did it. That is incredible. Just the detective work here. We see tier one pack and the resub juke and the prime scary man and the resub genius and virgin shadow. What? A cult in a boarding school? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it is pretty wild. What are you doing? What do you think I'm doing? Just watching One Piece. Okay, well, have fun. I'm not even playing any games right now. <laughs> Well, that's fine. Yeah, you're in a good arc. You're having fun. It's a really good arc. It really is. Thanks to the resub side, Jellyfish. Hi, chat. I'm seeing all the hellos, but I can't read too much past that because my glasses are not on. Anyways, I'm yeah. going to go back to that. Okay, well, have fun. Much to the school's displeasure, these cases successfully gained ample attention. Joe Ritchie resultingly paid off numerous judges and journalists in hopes of drowning out the negative press. Thanks for prime proximity. However, outsiders were beginning to catch on that these students were running for a reason. Quick text message. But why? There we go. Okay. All good. Thanks the resub adventure creature mumbling hot in the prime ego. A 15-year-old girl named Martha Moxley was out with her friends participating in what they call Mischief Night. This typically involved TPing houses, ding-dong kitchen, typical teenager antics. Later that night, mm. Moxley found a liking to a Thomas Skakel, eventually kissing him before the pair decided to venture off. To the other friends in their group, seeing Moxley fall over the Skakel's backyard fence with Thomas was the very last time that they would ever see her alive. The next morning, the Moxley family awakens as usual. They go about their morning routine. 
however, notice that Martha is missing. Upon searching the house for her, they notice a body lying by the tree out in the backyard. And they don't really have one stoner boner. And discover a grim scene. Martha is lying, lifeless with her pants down. Her body appears to have been visibly beaten, and a few feet away from the body, broken remnants of a six iron golf club. Holy this shit. This club was eventually traced back to the Skakel family. Autopsy reports claimed that she was bludgeoned and stabbed to death, all by that six iron. And since Thomas Skakel was the last person she was spotted with that night, he was the prime suspect in her murder. Due to a lack of sufficient evidence, however, he, among the other suspects, were eventually absolved. What? And as a result, the Moxley case, frustratingly, went cold. Three years later. Thomas's 18-year-old brother named Michael Skakel is arrested for drunk driving. What a great His family all around. Admission to Elan. While there, Skakel was known to be problematic and outspoken. According to Elan students at the time, he would regularly boast about a girl named Martha and how he sexually assaulted and killed her. One student named Gregory Coleman What a weird thing to brag family, about. Recounting how Michael had gone on record to state that I'm going to get away with murder. I'm a Kennedy. The Kennedy reference was alluding to his relation to Robert F. Kennedy. What? Something that would prove pivotal in what? launching his eventual trial to the national spotlight. At the time of his confession, though, nobody could do anything about it. Given the overbearing nature of the rules set at school, any student that tried to tell someone about this was quickly reprimanded. It would take an entire 22 years before Skakel's actions would reach the public eye. In January of 2000, he was arrested and charged with the murder of Martha Moxley, and due to his relation to the Kennedys, it was a case that commanded the airwaves. Since Skakel's primary vehicle of bragging about his crimes was Elan, this, by proxy, had also thrust the school into the national spotlight. Thanks, Arisa. Dozens First of students year. took the stand, exposing the callousness <clears throat> that occurred there. The humiliation, the general meetings, the beatings, the ring, the deaths, all of it was brought into the public eye. Realizing this, Joe Ritchie did everything he possibly could to keep discussion about his operation to a minimum. He looks like Neil Breen. He eventually took the stand, downplaying any mention of Elan, touting its high success rate, and doing Thanks everything he doink. possibly could to divert the attention back to Skakel and, hope you like God's and Skakel creamy. only. But this was only marginally effective, as this was in the 2000s. An interconnected era of information, catalyzed by a little something called the internet. That piece of shit, huh? Michael Skakel was eventually found guilty of the murder and was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. After serving just 11 years behind bars, he was granted a new trial in 2013, in which he was let go after posting a $1.2 million bond. Oh, Jesus. Today, he walks a free man. But, back I then, one sarcastic, the cat was out of the bag. Swift and the stick. inhumanities committed at the Elan School were documented in one of the most high-profile cases in decades. And because of this, people began talking theorizing and investigating, effectively marking the beginning of the end of Joe Ritchie's iron grip on the hundreds of students that were helpless beneath him. Thanks for resub Nathan and the prime green gorilla and two sub sarcastic. But with his weakening grasp on the media surrounding his operation came a different hurdle that Joe Ritchie would soon have to overcome. In June of 2000, he was diagnosed with lung cancer caused by his well-known addiction to cigarettes. And just six months later, on the 29th of January, 2001, Joe Ritchie would pass away in Portland, Maine at 54 years old. As a result, his second wife, Sharon Terry, would take over operations at Elan. It was clear though, that due to the increased publicity among the rising alumni testimonies, the idea of Terry having a lot of PR work on her plate was putting it lightly. Throughout the years, numerous changes would be put in place in response to outs- Hold on, someone just said something. Skakel is in jail, by the way. His conviction got reinstated in 2016. Thanks, Risa Monty. 
Geo expert in chasing bubbles. Well, this video is brand new and he said that he's a free man. Let me see. Let's take a peek. I don't see anything about him going back to jail. Yeah, there's nothing about him going back to jail. Literally nothing. It got reinstated, just exonerated in 2020. Oh. For instance, the ring was eventually forbidden from being used as punishment. And while this was substantially a good thing, the other cruelties would remain. What Sharon Terry was unaware of, though, was that due to the rapid rise in technology, namely the internet, even her reign over Elan would soon meet its demise. When the water settled following the Skakel case, mentions of Elan were made on various forums throughout the next few years. They would get people talking, however it wasn't quite enough for definite action. By 2010 though, something would change. A website that we all know very well would help spearhead one of the most effective exposed stories in the history of the internet. I want to take a guess. I don't know the story, but I want to guess. Is it something awful? Something awful used to be pretty powerful. No way, is it Reddit? God damn it. That website Fuck. was Reddit. Son of a bitch! On November 26th, 2010, a man named Jeff W, who went by Gazaz My Hero, would make a post titled, Even skimming this once will blow your mind. Most probably think it's made up, but you'd be dead wrong. Within it, he explains that he was an Elan student in 1998, before outlining, in detail, the reality of what took place there. They're mostly points that we've already covered and explored in great detail tonight, but back then, these claims were unbelievable. The school was very much still in operation, so some initially had a tough time wrapping their head around the fact that a place like this actually existed. But then came the comments. The other stories from other alumni with their own experiences. Gazaz My Hero's post carried weight. It was real. And these atrocities Maybe resub, needed the to be tier known. One Dewey knows and two sub Zugi. Eventually, this thread would rack up over 2,000 likes and 1.4 thousand comments. While <clears> this may not have caused Alan's closure outright, it aggressively <clears> reopened <throat> old wounds. 2010 <clears throat> was not 2000. The internet user base was exponentially larger than it had been, and resultingly, the effectiveness of this newfound attention caused a massive amount of backlash that the Elan School had never before experienced. These three sub chimeras. Four months later. On the 23rd of March, 2011, the Elan School announced that it would soon be shutting down. Sharon Terry blamed the call on what they deemed to be libelous remarks made about them online. The school has been the target of harsh and false attacks spread over the internet with the avowed purpose of forcing the school to close. The school, unfortunately, has been unable to survive the damage. Shucks. And on the 1st of April 2011, the Elan school would close its doors. For what a great time. date to close on, on fucking April Officially, Fool's Day. They blamed it on declining student numbers in hopes of diverting the attention away from the actual cause. But on the outside, everyone knew the real reason. For students, this was unbelievably good news. However, the damage they endured was something that would remain. Thanks to the prime bands and sutrus and the resub, Wilhelm, it's been reported Gigan, that and numerous Kolthog. suicides have occurred as a result of attendance at Elan. PTSD with alumni is rampant, and it's clear that the school had done nothing but damage people. A filmmaker and former student named Todd Nilsson Creator of a fantastic Elan documentary named The Last Stop has gone on record to state that, as a student, he was helped by their unconventional tactics, but he knew the majority of others weren't quite so lucky. Today, hundreds of stories remain online about the cruelty committed at the Elan school, about the facade they upkept for 41 years. Reading through these are eye-opening and you can find them on nearly every piece of media and documentation that exists about Elan online. To all of you that have shared employees. your stories, 
that have opened Sutras up about the torment you went I through, carry the your voice is literally. the reason that Alon ceases to exist today. This video would not exist without you, and I wish I could say that I feel your pain. But I don't. What's Sharon Terry up to? Let me take a peek. Sharon Terry, what's going on? Wow, since 2011 she has vanished. Holy fuck. Her spirit was trapped in Elan and when it closed down she just ceased to exist. Holy fuck. Yeah, I cannot find anything of Sharon Terry after 2011. My god. Well, thanks for the resub. Physics. God damn, that was fucking intense. So I imagine over the course of 41 years, they must have had a lot of students graduate. And I'm really surprised that it took Reddit to be the one to finally shut that shit down from one post. The graduates were brainwashed. That's true. I guess it's hard to really understand that perspective. Since I obviously wasn't there for the brainwashing. I'm gonna go fill up my water now. I'll be right back. I'm very curious about this. Hello. Recommended actually it's gave Rose. me something that sounded interesting. Right, hello? This is Rhodey, aka Warm Sheet. The former is played by actor and Academy Award nominee Terrence Howard. The latter is played by actor and yeah. Don Cheadle. Don Lord Cheadle, Lord the man. Run. Also, Terrence Howard's the guy you might remember has been trying his best to convince the world that one, uh, one times one equals two. He tries to completely change math as we know it. That's how I know Terrence Howard. The first Iron Man film, but you might not know why. There's Didn't he want like a ton of money? Within these big franchises that consistently gets torn down and torn apart by the media when you realize what's going on underneath. But having the title of Oscar winner on a resume means that they can also charge more for their performances. By the time Iron Man was rolling into production, so it is a money thing. I'm pretty sure it was just money. Around 3.5 to four and a half million dollars for that performance. Not bad. This made him one of the highest paid actors in the film. Pretty and solid. At that time, he actually paid over six times more than Robert Downey Jr. He only made about five hundred thousand dollars. Only is the, the wrong film. word for that Pure number, I think. Studio on set money. When a project like Iron Man is successful enough to create a franchise, it's usually great for everyone involved. The directors and producers- Except Terrence Howard. Sequels, Robert Downey Jr. was rumored to have made $10 million for the second film, a pay increase of about 2,000%. Not, Not bad. Was able to, on the other hand, was actually offered a significant decrease oh. in pay from what he was expecting to earn. I'm jealous. Next time. Marvel eventually offered only one million dollars. It's rumored that Iron Man director John Favreau was ultimately unhappy with Terrence Howard's performance. I do Spent remember hearing that they did not like him. Like he was very this rude. Great from, but to make sure that Terrence Howard's future roles would be measured against a larger contract. Yeah, so it really was a money thing, and they just didn't like him in the movie. Returns in the future on the next film or the it's film. It's not super that. deep. It doesn't After seem. Dust said, publicly claimed that he was the one who recommended RDJ for the role of Iron Man. But that he oh. ultimately was happy with the way things turned out. <laughs> Terrence Howard is a really weird guy, though. Like, aside from giving a bad performance and wanting more money, he's a very unlikable person to work with from everything I I remember reading. Plus, he's the guy that keeps really trying to push that one times one equals two. <clears throat> Billionaire wants to create futuristic city in Arizona desert. And he wants the first phase to be built by 2030. Team Charles Michael Doudna has... Sounds cool to me. But is this utopia built in the desert even possible? The yes. Technology to do what he Who is this, God? Oh my God. Holy it's Lord. Cool. Where is he? He's the first person that tried to build utopia. In fact, wow. Lord wouldn't even be the first... Man's communicating from heaven. I wish him the best. Good luck. I was just reading about the Jagex situation. They just shut down Runelight HD which has been in production for two years where a guy named 117 put 2,000 hours of his life into it and it was supposed to release, I think it was today, 
and Jagex today said, fuck you, and they shut it down. Even though they've known about its existence for the last two years, they waited until launch day to shut it down, just to fuck this guy in the ass as hard as they could. It was despicable. I was reading up on that. From what I understand, it wasn't the old school RuneScape team that did it. It was more of like the upper echelon of Jagex, but my god. That's some toxic shit. If they really didn't want that, they could have told them at the beginning. Have I watched the update on Yandere Simulator? No, let's check it out. Is Yandere Dev still acting like a weirdo? Oh, it's done? He's made a statement on the WordPress. He's made a statement on his patron. He's decided to let the people know who are financially supporting him what exactly is going on here. All right, read it's ready. Read wow, look at that. <clears throat> so after what, nine years in development? It's finally ready? I mean, it, this is probably one of the most troubled developments of all time. Very public meltdowns, almost nothing going right, but we got there, baby. We fucking got there. It's not actually done. These posts make it sound like he thinks it's done. Oh, it's just a separate game mode that he finished. Jesus Christ. Oh. <laughs> oh my God. All right, I see. I see what's happened here. Jesus Christ. What's the point in never finishing the project? Is there any benefit to him? Yandere Simulator is a, like, it's old school. This shit was in development for so long. Most of the big YouTubers played it. PewDiePie, Markiplier, Jacksepticeye, they've all played Yandere Sim. It was a massive, massive game when it was, like, first released as, like, a demo thing. And then I believe it was uh, put up as a crowdfunding thing that has just never even been close to done and the developer has very public meltdowns he like purges his discord and hangouts once a week or at least he used to it, it's been a true disaster of a journey